Welcome to Instant Impact with Elise Archer. Guys, I have the coolest guest on the show for you today. Her name is Dara Brustein, and I first met Dara about a year and a half ago. Uh, she was a speaker at the small intimate mastermind that I was a part of in Atlanta. And as she started talking about this whole concept of lifestyle design, I thought, I need to know this woman. Uh, Dara is so accomplished, so dynamic. And she's really dedicated a lot of her life to teaching this concept of lifestyle design, which I think many of us can relate to her backstory of doing the things that we think we're supposed to do to be successful, checking the boxes, and then getting to a certain point where you realize, I'm not fulfilled. And it very much aligns with a lot of my own personal journey from my 20s. And so I really wanted to bring her on today to talk about how she's created this lifestyle that so many people would love to have. Uh, Dara travels the world throughout the year. She's a writer for Forbes. She's created one of the largest networking groups in the country, Network Under 40, where she's had over 30,000 um, different people attend her events throughout the year. And she's very, very um, curated about how she puts together her lifestyle, what she spends her time on, her focus and attention on. And as if all of that wasn't cool enough, um, in January of this year, she launched a master, a ma she launched a master class can't talk there, with uh, Deepak Chopra. I mean, how incredible is that? And they've created this masterclass called Diving Deep with Deepak and Dara, and it's all about how to live a more meaningful life. And so on the show today, I wanted to find out about how we can create a lifestyle by design. She also shares more fun things about how she connected with Deepak originally and how the whole masterclass came together. But one of the places where I think you'll really relate to a lot of what she talks about is that everything that she's done has been all about building deeper relationships with other people. And that's so much of what I'm passionate about is building deeper connections. I know you probably are if you're listening to the show as well. And so I really wanted to find out from her about how she has used the power of building deep relationships with other people to create such a, an incredible life and an incredible lifestyle. And so you're going to love, Dara, this is one of the conversations where I thought, if I could just have two hours with you, at least, that would be amazing. But to honor all of our time, um, it's, uh, I kept it a little bit shorter, but you're just going to love her. And she's got so many free resources on her website as well. So you can head on over to Dara.co to check out all the goodies. And she shares some of the things that you can um, engage in at the end of the show. But I can't wait for you to meet Dara. And so I'm going to go ahead and introduce her to you right after this message. Dara, welcome to the Instant Impact Podcast. I am just so, so looking forward to having this conversation with you today. Me too. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So I feel like you are all over social and a lot of people probably already know who you are, but for the uninitiated, um, if you can just share a little bit about who you are and what you do, that would be great. Well, that's a really kind gesture of you to assume that. So I'm going to assume the latter that people don't know. So I am an entrepreneur and a writer. On the writer side, I write for outlets like Forbes and Thrive Global and Entrepreneur and Boss Babes on how to create a life uh, by intentional relationship building. So love to do lots of interviews, work with lots of high profile people to really extract how they did that for themselves. And on the entrepreneurial side, I've grown a number of businesses, one in the payment processing space, one in the networking event space, one in financial literacy for kids space, and most recently compiling everything I've learned to help other people intentionally design their lives, build businesses to fund it and networks to support it. So one of the things that I wanted to ask you about is this whole idea of lifestyle design. And when I met you last year for the first time, you came and spoke at a mastermind I'm a part of, and you started talking about the concept of lifestyle design. And I feel like I had heard the term before, but it wasn't something I had really spent a lot of time looking into. Tell us a little bit about what that even means. Yeah, it's such a great question because I think it can be confusing because everyone thinks like, oh, lifestyle, it's just creating some sort of thing that looks great to people. But really to me, lifestyle design means being the architect or the painter of the creation that you're making or being the writer of your own story. It's getting off of autopilot and being the person who intentionally chooses where you want to go in your life and then making sure your actions align to get you there. Wow. It's an interesting concept because I think, you know, for a lot of the people listening, it's like we have millennials, we have Gen X, we have some boomers, but a lot of times we stop and we, maybe we don't stop and we should, but I think at a certain point in our lives, we stop and ask the question of 
well, am I doing this just because this is what I always thought I was supposed to do? Like even my husband, he's a respiratory therapist. He's been doing it for a long time, but we had the conversation recently of if you were to do this now from scratch, like what would you do? And he was like, I don't know that I would do this. And so it's just, it's an interesting question, I think, to stop and be really intentional about why am I doing what I'm doing? And then being able to pivot if you need to. I'm curious about, um, you mentioned one of the, it's like, it seems to me one of the pillars of lifestyle design that you talk about is intentional networking and building key relationships that help support the type of lifestyle you want to live. And I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that because I think sometimes people may hear that and say, well, is that elitism if I choose to have like, <laughs> Right. I can see people wondering that. I don't know that this audience would, but I, I, I think some people would. What do you mean by that about identifying what the right relationships are to help you build the lifestyle you're looking for? It doesn't mean that you're looking for people to transact with. It means that you're looking for people who are elevating you and you, they, that you're on the same journey, even if it's not identical. But it, for me, at least I'll give the example. For me, it's about finding people who are equally growth oriented. They're people who are often entrepreneurial, but maybe they're not practicing that. Maybe they just have an entrepreneurial mindset. They're people who are curious and they're open-minded because they're the people that are going to up-level me to understand that there's more and that we're not just going to live in the status quo environment. And so when I say it's intentional networking, it doesn't mean that I'm going out and saying, I have this thing or this aim or this product that I want to sell or get in front of people who can help me do that. It's not, I want to meet this specific person and I must break down every door to get to them. While there might be circumstances that someone could have that need and we could talk about that more specifically. It's really about curating a group of people around you that are going to be that up-leveling effect and making sure that it's making you look at the world from a broader, bigger perspective and that at the bottom line, you just like them. Like if you don't have natural rapport, chemistry, kinship, you don't just like who they are as a person, then they shouldn't be in your network in the first place. So it's just that bottom line starting there. So how would somebody go about and start doing that if they've never really thought about super intentional network building before? Do they just need to start going to local networking events? Do they need to join a mastermind? Do they need to hop on LinkedIn? And like, what would you suggest would be some of the first steps for someone who really wants to do that? It probably depends where you are in your path and your journey, but there's a lot of great ways to build networks from where you already are. And this is a misconception I hear a lot of people say when they're perhaps earlier in their career, like they've just graduated from college or they're making an industry change or they've geographically made a change that people feel really stuck and they wonder, how do I start to begin to grow a network, especially when it can feel like oh, I already had one over here. But here's the thing is we all already have a network, no matter your age or otherwise. And on top of that, we have this great technology at our disposal where we can connect with anyone anywhere at any time, which is really powerful. So I think while things like masterminds are great and networking events are great, and chambers of commerce and associations are great. Sometimes the best and easiest path of least resistance is to dig in and pour into the grass that you're already tending to. So the people you went to school with, the people you've had jobs with, the people who have been in your family and your friend circles since you were a child. And it's often not obvious. Sometimes it's just having those quick catch-ups or sending an email and just saying, hey, I'm up to this new thing, what are you doing? And sort of digging a little deeper. And that often opens a door to say, this is where I'm aiming to go. Might you have any ideas? Might you know someone? Because most people love to give advice and most people want to be helpful. So when you come at them in a way that's sincere and they already have that relationship and foundation with you, it's that much easier to have them say, absolutely, let me introduce you to Elise or so-and-so, or here's this organization that I think would be great for you. And it really cuts down on the effort and time that it might take for you to begin to build in that new arena. I absolutely love that, especially because you run a massive networking event. And so the thing that would probably be in your best interest when you answer that question is to say, well, you need to go out and start joining these networking <laughs> events and you can come to mind. But really, I love what you said there, because I think it's true that often there's huge opportunities and beautiful relationships to be had right underneath our fingertips. And sometimes we just take people for granted because we see them every day or, you know, we haven't, it's like we knew them five years ago and it was a different context. So I really, really love that. Um, 
Can I share yeah. one thing to that? It's that one, it's the start where you are, like always start where you are rather than try and build a foundation somewhere new. But also there's a Stanford study called the study of weak or loose ties. I can't remember specifically, but it talks about this idea that most opportunities are created and initiated by our secondary, third, and fourth degree ties. So they're those weak ties. It's not often the people with whom you're closest, but it's those people who make the introductions to what we would visually think of as like our second, third, fourth degree connections on LinkedIn. And there are the people who, because of the reputational equity that you got to ride in on, because of your contact that already knows, likes, and trusts you, that you're able to get where you're going more quickly. It's so, exactly, exactly. It's like, don't take people for granted. You never know who they know, how they can help, or how you can be of service to them as well, yes. which is equally important. So one of the things that you talk about, which I love since you do run such a massive networking organization is the right and the wrong way to do an icebreaker when we're meeting someone. And so you've got this awesome guide on your site of I think it's 55 different questions to ask. I'm probably butchering the name, but, so you can Close. correct me, but 55 different good questions to ask when you're meeting someone, something like that. <laughs> Not that, but what I'd love to hear from you is maybe a couple of examples of first the wrong way that we might try to get to know somebody. And then what would you say would be a better way to ask questions and get to know someone? So this is going to be probably surprising to some people, but I think the worst and wrong question to ask when you immediately meet someone is what do you do? Mm -hmm. And we have been really socialized to believe that that is such a great icebreaker because if you're in a networking event, you probably are trying to get to do some business at some point. But I tend to believe that it is really the wrong approach that people want to be seen, they want to know that you care about who they are, and that ultimately relationships are most valuable when they're sought from a long-term perspective. And as you referred to, Elise, it's about when you can give before you can get and add value first. So I think better questions, and the thing that you're referring to is called the 55 best questions to ask to break the ice and really get to know someone. And it's broken into three sections. It's mild, medium, and hot. Hot being more when you're deeper in a relationship with someone. But the, the mild questions are not hard, but they're just about changing your habits from asking the, what do you do to things like, what's on your mind or what brought you here or what have you been reading lately or just some really th simple questions that get someone to start being able to share what is important to them and what makes them tick so you can find the little clues that you can build on, find kinship, develop a relationship from there and often sometimes accidentally, which is the best way I think, you'll back into what they do, which is great because eventually you'll talk about it. But I think what often happens and how I feel when someone immediately comes in and just says, hi, I'm Dara, what do you do? Then I'm sitting there feeling like, wow, they're, they're just wanting something from me. I feel sized up. I feel like this is a transaction. And then I start to get nervous of, well, if I don't say something they like, are they just going to turn around and walk away? And no one wants to feel like that. No one wants to make someone feel like that. And I venture to guess 99% of the time when we ask that question, we're not intending to do that, but we need to be responsible for the consequence of what we say in the world. And intention is important. So if your intention is to truly build a relationship, consider looking at these questions and pulling a few to have in your back pocket to ask people to break the ice in a better way that's going to sustain a more it's going to sustain the likelihood of a better relationship long-term. Mm, that's so powerful. And it puts people more at ease, I would say. I never thought about it that way, that when you're asked what you do, you, you kind of go into that defense mode of, is it good enough? But when it's a deeper question that gets to know more about the person and shows concern for who the person is, it does put, put them more at ease. I'm interested just from your background and, and, you know, you've built this huge personal brand around lifestyle design and relationship building and networking. Why is all of this so important to you? It's important to me because I struggled with it myself. Mm. I spent the first 12, 13 years of like of a go of my career really struggling. I remember graduating from college in 2006 and just jumping into the world in a way that I was really simply just crossing the T's and dotting the I's that other people told me I was supposed to do it was, you know, get the job, have a sexy title, have the flashy things, work really hard, wear busyness as a badge of honor, stress about your bank account secretly behind the scenes, commute and not have any free time for the things you actually value. 
And I remember hitting a wall time and again over the course of the first three years out of being out of college where I had been laid off over and over and over again. The first time it was three months after I had bought a house in duress after having a restraining order against my landlord at the time and just looked at it and I thought, if this is what everyone's been telling me to get so excited about as a young adult, something isn't working. I don't feel fulfilled. This isn't stable. I'm scared and stressed all the time. And so at that point, I thought, I'm going to start taking the reins into my own hands and intentionally choosing my path. And not to say that the second I chose that the next 10 years were gravy, I definitely had challenges and there was a lot of learning. But what happened was about a year ago, I hit this point where I thought, I really need to share this with people. The question I am asked more than any other question is, how do you live the life that you do? And what people meant by that is, how do you run these businesses? How do you have the freedom of your time? How do you travel 60% of the time while doing that? How do you work with people like Deepak Chopra and Shaquille O'Neal? How do you be in rooms like Ted and Davos? And like, none of that is braggarty. Like, I don't mean it like that. I just mean they see it from the outside and they want to know what it really takes to execute it on their terms for themselves. And my favorite thing in the world, the thing I know I was put on this planet to do was to connect people to people and people to resources to advance the outcomes for both. So I thought, you know what? I have been a student in my own life and I'm going to start compiling these resources and tools and giving them to other people because this is important. And at the end of the day, if we don't have our own stuff in check, we don't have anything to give to other people. So while some misconstrue self-help or self-work or self-care for selfishness, I think it's the exact opposite. It's very much that you put the mask on yourself before you help other people. You have to have an abundance to be able to give in your excess. So for me, it was just really important to say, why would I selfishly hold these things? Let me share them. Okay. So you cannot drop stuff, like everything you just dropped (laughs) and then not tell us how. So I would love to hear from you. So for people who are listening and saying, well, how does she travel 60% of the time and network with people like Deepak and Shaquille O'Neal and how do, like how has she built the life she has? What are some of the keys? Teach us. <laughs> Here's like the <laughs> one minute cliff notes. You've got one minute, go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I will say in, in all fairness, I have a lot of this online because it really is a lot more depth than I'm going to be able to share in this like tiny moment. But the intention is the first piece that I had to have that moment and the ongoing continuation of those self-checks and reflections to say, is where I am working for me. And also too, I think you can universally kind of, this is gonna get a little woo woo, but you can look around and think, am I swimming upstream? Is the current with me or against me? And some of those basic things become really fundamental ways to understand for yourself, am I on the right path? Like I know I'm going in the right direction, which has allowed me to work towards these things that are demarcations of what success looks like for me of the travel and everything else because the dominoes fall naturally. Because I put in the work and the intention on a day-to-day basis and I show up, which is important. You show up even when you don't feel like it. That is critical. It's what a professional does. However, I know that I'm in the right place because the things are working doesn't mean that there is not challenge. I have many stories I'd be happy to share of being in a pool of my own tears and questioning and doubting and things not working. But what I've come to realize is if I can really appreciate that uncertainty is the only certainty, that then I don't resist those things. And then I let the current keep taking me in that direction instead of, again, resisting and swimming upstream. So that intention piece is critical. And the part of that intention is, For people to not look at each other and say, well, you're doing it that way. That looks cool. I guess I'll do it that way because that's the antithesis of the entire lifestyle design approach is you really have to parse out what works for you. What do you really want? And with the example you gave of your husband, Elise, I think it's great because none of us were trained to think and dream in these ways. When we were children, we did, but I always looked at it as what have I seen done before? But a lot of us are now doing things that we have never seen before. We didn't have these tools and resources. Industries didn't exist. So how do you separate yourself enough from where you are and what you see to be able to think more expansively than that? And then just do tiny steps and iterations because this is the other piece too, that one of the things that held me back so much in my earlier years was this deep fear of what people were going to think, especially if I failed as I saw or perceived it in front of them. And some of the most liberating things that I came to learn 
where that one, you don't really fail if you keep going, even if you pivot and it changes. And two, it was really egotistical and narcissistic of me to assume that people were paying that much attention because frankly, they're not. And that actually is really freeing to realize there's billions of people on this planet. Most people are pretty heads down working on their thing and in their own little silos and communities. And people who are paying attention, they're there because they support me. And yeah, I'll be honest, I posted about this the other day. There are some haters and they pop up and the more you put yourself out there, they're going, they're going to arise. But that's okay too, because that's really just a reflection of where they are. And it also means that people are paying attention. So in like a, in a way that means that your voice is being heard. So that's just like a tiny, tiny bit of what it takes to start doing it. But the other piece and why I think, well, actually two more pieces, why I think the relationship part is so critical is because it is the people you know and who know you and of you who open the doors to the success you're seeking. So if you are not digging the well before you're thirsty, if you are not building the relationships and building the trust and adding value before you need stuff from people, because it's natural, there will be times when you have to ask, it's kind of too late at that point. And not to say you can't do it from there, but you don't want to go in with an ask, especially a big one, when you have built no rapport and no foundation. And then the other piece is really the financial freedom. And I think so few people are willing to talk about the money piece, but I was really fortunate to back into my first company with my twin brother and credit card processing because it's a residual based income. And I was really lucky because once I hit a point where that business got to a place where I didn't feel like I was growing as much as I wanted to, I was able to step back and say, this business has recurring revenue that's going to pour in and allows me the freedom and space to explore what I want. And while everyone's not gonna perhaps be in that situation, it's the beauty of side hustles. It's the beauty of being able to do multiple things at the same time. So you can find out what do I need to do to create enough financial flexibility and freedom for myself to really dive into the stuff that matters to me and start designing the life that I want. Mm. So powerful. And, and the thing is too, there's so many opportunities today that can create that residual income and that can create extra revenue coming in so that you don't have to be stressed out. And one thing, so there's actually a couple of things that I want to ask you more about, but one of the things you said really stuck out to me about, am I swimming upstream? And this is something that I think I used to feel very confused about. And it wasn't until recently that I kind of got, oh, things actually really are for the most part supposed to flow relatively easily when you're in the right space. But I think there's also a lot of um, information or talk out there about it's, it's going to be hard, right? You got to hustle. It's going to feel hard. You're going to feel burnout. That's okay. It's just part of the process. What's the difference between that versus just allowing yourself to, to flow, right? And let the dominoes fall. And should things really be that easy or are we fooling ourselves? I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. So I don't think that most things are super black and white. I tend to see life in a spectrum. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, there's a couple episodes Deepak and I have done in our weekly video series where we've talked about this really counterintuitive approach to life of effortlessness and doing less to achieve more. And it's funny because I remember when I got into my relationship with my, like my love relationship with my partner, Brendan, about two and a half years ago, I kept remarking on how effortless it was. And it was one of these first instances where I started to think, wow, like there really is something to this. And we, together we started to dig into the idea that just because you try and you show up and you put work into something, it can still also be effortless. So, mm. you know, I'll give this example. And you probably see, saw this because you and I are Facebook friends. Mm. And so I'll give the example of the, how the Deepak thing started. It was like truly the most effortless thing that has ever happened in my career. And one of the things for which I am most grateful and have seen so many dividends just for my personal growth. So last year, when I made this decision to kind of have my coming out party of helping people with lifestyle design and all of this that goes with it, I thought to myself, I'm going to run a virtual summit. It's going to be entirely free. It's going to be for three days. And it's going to have all of my mentors and peers teaching people how to do everything that I've learned. And some of these are my mentors who have never met me and they don't know that I am a student of theirs because that's one of the beautiful things about mentorship that you can read people's work, you can listen to their talks and they can from afar mentor you. So Deepak was on my wish list. So through the chain of networks, because that's how the world works, I was introduced to his publicists. 
And they were really interested, but they kept coming back to me with, well, who else is doing it? Who else is doing it? And I had some names. We had Adam Grant and Jen Sincero and some other folks, but they kept wanting to know like, who else is doing it. So I decided to reach out to my network and I said to my friend Rebecca, whom I had met years prior at a conference, who at the time I had no idea had this in her history that she happened to have been the COO for Depop. So I texted Rebecca and I said, listen, here's where I am. Would you be willing to put in a good word? So she sends me a screenshot of the messages and three hours later, I have a yes from his publicist and a week later, I'm in New York interviewing him. So in my mind, this is the end. I'm thinking, what a once in a lifetime experience. I will never forget this and I was so grateful for it. But as serendipity happened, three months later, Chase Bank hired me to be an influencer on social media for them as well as to be an onsite correspondent at their, at their uh, conference where I got to interview Deepak again and Cam Newton. And I'm in the green room and I'm just chuckling, thinking like, wow, this is so nuts that three months ago, I didn't know this man and now I've interviewed him twice and he was so kind and gracious. Fast forward to the end of 2018, I got to interview him twice more and his daughter. And the day after Christmas, this past Christmas, I sent him an email just because intuitively I thought, I really want to let him know how grateful I am. And I had done this every time we had interacted, but I said, I really just want to let him know how grateful I am and that I'm here to support him in 2019 if he needs anything. 15 minutes later, I had an email in my inbox from him saying, I was reflecting too. I think you can help me. My stuff can often be esoteric and hard to understand. And I think you can help me translate that to people. And within a series of emails back and forth, we landed on this video series and two weeks later it was live. And now it's been going every single week. And I say it all because it was this effortlessness that if I had been holding so tightly to, okay, in 2019, I'm going to have exactly X, Y, and Z, and it's going to look just like this. I would have totally missed this window. And I wouldn't have thought about taking that time to just say that to him with no expectation. I wouldn't have been pouring into the relationship and I might've missed this entire opportunity. So effortlessness is real. Letting the cards fall as they may is real. And I hope that what people understand from this as well is that it doesn't mean that I'm not showing up and that I'm not a hard worker. Elise, you are just like this too. Like we put in the hours, we put in the work, but we're not grinding and white knuckling our way through. Yes, yes, yes. Amen to everything you just said. It's such a cool story and it's so powerful to see the, what happens when you are in alignment with what you're meant to be doing. You're living out your purpose and you're following your intuition and then you're focusing on really like, how can I help other people and how can I express appreciation? And I can so relate to so much of what you said. And I've always been a hard worker, like you referenced, but I remember I used to get migraines like every single day and everything would feel so hard. This was in my early to mid twenties. And I was very, very focused on checking the boxes, like you said, and I got to get the six figure income. I got to look a certain way, have certain friends, you know, all that stuff. And I was quite frankly, I was really focused on that and I was very successful at work and I was, I was checking the boxes, but my health was deteriorating. I was having the migraines, especially on Sunday night, just thinking about Monday morning and what was coming up. And it was like, I would just always have this underlying current of anxiety. And I thought that was how it was supposed to be. And when I realized that it doesn't have to be like that, nor is it meant to be like that, life is so much more fun. And just like you mentioned, the things that show up and the opportunities that come to you are ridiculous. <laughs> and they're so much more fun. And I think for a less you know dramatic example, but even just for us, like I told you, we recently, my husband, and I recently found this new house. When we set the, we were not looking for a new house. And when we decided to start looking literally within a week and a half, we were making an offer. We had found our dream home. We were making an offer. It was like everything happened so easily and so seamlessly, which usually does not happen in the house buying world. We actually <laughs> technically shouldn't have qualified because I had last year, I was an independent contractor. Then I was an employee. Then I was an independent contractor again with the company I'm a part of. So it's like, we really shouldn't have even qualified for the loan. Hopefully no one is listening from the, <laughs> the <laughs> <other things. laughs> like, somehow <laughs> everything happened and it was easy and it was just amazing how it all worked. Yeah. So, really, go I'm ahead. so sorry to off, no, but go I ahead. think we have been, it has been hammered into our minds that it has to be hard and you have to struggle 
for you to have earned it. And it, I'm not saying you sit back and just wait for everything to show up to you. It is not about that. But the second you really allow yourself to try out what we're talking about truly, and you start to see that this is real, you'll start to question why we had these paradigms in the first place. And frankly, the more I've been thinking about it, the more I think it is attached to the industrial era and this idea that we have to get people who are going to show up and grind it out at work all day. But y'all, we're in the information era now and things are different and it doesn't have to be like that. Thank you. Yeah, it's so true. Again, it's re-examine your thinking. It's exactly what you teach, right? It's why are you doing what you're doing? Re-examine it. Where did that come from? Yeah, question it. Mm -hmm. like, you might get back to the same answer. That's fine. But question it and know that you chose that. Yes. Wow. It's absolutely, absolutely true. I, I, I'd like to hear a little bit from you as we, I, you know, I told, this is funny, I told you off camera before that sometimes I feel like I'm going to struggle to find enough questions to fill the space with a guest. With you, when I was doing my pre-work for the show, I was like, I'm just going to need her for a full day and everyone is just going to have to sit down and not do anything for this whole interview because it's going to be like a day-long masterclass. So I, we'll have to have you back because I have so many more things I want to ask you about, um, but I also want to be cognizant of time here. So um, final couple of questions here for you. One is you have done an incredible job of building really high level relationships. And in your case, they have been with some true like celebrities. Some people listening want to do that. Some people listening have done that. Other people just have people in their network, whether it's an ideal client or a mentor who they would love to get to know, but they feel like that person is so beyond them right? and they don't want to have, they don't want to come and just seem greedy or like they're asking and be off putting. How would you advise someone to start building a relationship with someone who feels maybe like a little bit out of reach? Yeah, I totally relate to that. I always have felt that way. And fortunately, the more I've leaned into that, it's quieted a lot of the voices in my head that have said like, who am I to talk to those people? Why would they want to know me? And really recognize the humanity in all of us that we're all the same. But at the end of the day, with that humanity, it made me really recognize just what my foundational understanding of relationship building is in the first place. That if I can offer value to you, it's going to make you want to know a little bit more about me. And so having a platform like you have, Elise, having a podcast and inviting them on. I write for Forbes. I can invite them there. I can ask people I know who I already have the connection with to make a warm introduction. There's a lot of ways that you can get creative with platforms or with entry points to add value to someone so that you're not going in straight with an ask or an extraction. Because I think this is really poor form that we've often been trained is okay when it's sort of this, let me pick your brain syndrome of let me enter a space and try and extract as much from you as I can, but we have no relationship, trust, or otherwise. Mm. And I think that you should owe that to me. And so I think to sort of step back and think, if I were in this person's shoes, we are all quite full in our plates. There's a lot going on. What might be something that would be valuable for them? And to do that, that often takes research and it takes the time to really study what they're up to and figure out what they have going on. And you know, for me, often it's authors whom I really admire and want to learn from and with. So I'll read their books. I'll read their materials. I'll listen to their TED Talks. And then I'll sign up for their email list. And then after digesting, so this is not short, then I am sending an email and saying, hey, I really loved when you said that. And I write for Forbes if you ever would like an article written about you. Like I did this with Susan Cain just the other day. And it worked. I did it with Daniel Pink. It worked. And it's not because I'm manipulating. Like, I'm truly sincere. I actually really appreciate their work and I really want to elevate it in another space for them, which would be a no-brainer. Like, it is a no-brainer. Why wouldn't they say yes? And so if you don't have those platforms, that's okay. Write for Medium. Write for LinkedIn. Like, these are open source platforms. Start your own podcast. These have no barriers to entry. Or like start an event series like I started. Invite people to speak or do it remotely over a virtual summit like I did. There's a lot of ways that you can give people a platform or fill in the blank for whatever that is for you. Maybe it's you making an introduction or offering one that might be highly valuable for them from someone in your network who obviously is already bought in. You're not going to blindside anyone. Yeah. But it's oh just my always, always look for that cue. I so resonate with everything you just said. And part of what I like about it is 
I think sometimes it's not talked about enough, the importance of really having a platform for you know, people who have large social media followings or who are already doing it, like they get it. But there's also a lot of people listening who haven't really thought that much about why they need their own platform. And I found, like, I love that you mentioned the podcast because I've been the co-host of two previously, and this is the first one I'm doing on my own, but it's insane the doors that it opens when you have a place where you can elevate somebody else and it gives you access to those people that otherwise you probably wouldn't have. And so, like you said, it doesn't have to be a podcast. It can be something very simple and accessible, um, like writing on LinkedIn or Medium or whatever it is. Podcasts are easy too, right? So it's, it's simple and easy to create a platform today. And then the second piece that I love about what you said is treating them like a person. And I think it's, it's so easy to get starstruck and, and almost like objectify that person where it's like, they are just an object to be one. And I'm going to look so good when I get my photo with this person or whatever it is, but that's so gross. <laughs> and yeah. it's so, and look, it's like, it's kind of, I, I think we are biologically designed to an extent to want to climb higher and do all of those things. And so some of that is just innate in us, but you have to manage that because that other person is a person. And when you can look at them like a human and think about what would be really useful or helpful for them, it's a totally different energy that you're bringing to the interaction. Yeah. Well, I want to build on that because what we've also been trained to do is ask this question, how can I help you? Mm -hmm. And I think at its core, it's a really valuable question. However, it's often misused because people will say it in a place where they don't know you, they don't know what you can offer or bring to the table, and then it feels manipulative, like, why do you wanna help me and how do I even know how to answer that question? Yes. So it, one, I think it's positively uh, like stop someone in their tracks when you're talking to this person that you really wanna to talk to, especially if they're of some amount of high profile and they're just used to people sucking things from them and you come up and you just say something like, thank you, or I really loved this, or I have this one specific question for you and make it really specific because it shows that you care and you've done your homework, that matters. But when you go into a circumstance like that or a first meeting with someone and you just go with the, how can I help you? It starts to feel really trite and canned instead of you doing the work and looking for the clues and saying, you know, what's something you're working on? What are you excited about? Or is there anything that's a challenge for you? And trying to be the detective to figure out, oh, well, I have this resource or I know this person, would that be helpful for you? Rather than them having to figure out who are you? How can you help me? Why do you want to help me? It, that can also hurt the relationship. I was literally just thinking that today because I was going through, I batched my inbound LinkedIn connection requests. So I was going through and I was responding to messages and there was quite a few of people just saying, hey, I just wanted to connect and know how I can help you. And quite frankly, when I get that, I know they don't really, look, maybe they mean it, but what usually ends up happening is after you respond back, you're like, oh, by the way, if you know anyone who's looking for such and such, which is what I do or what I sell, I'd really appreciate that connection. And it's just, it's like, you're right. At its core, it is a useful question, but it really isn't <laughs> when you're trying to build deep relationships with people that last. And it, it does put more work on the other person, which the end doesn't build a relationship. So thank you for saying that. We are dispelling myths today on the Instagram <laughs> podcast. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> <busting>. <laughs> so you have like a million amazing resources for people on your site and online, and you've got the video series with Deepak. I would love if you could share just as we close out here, what resources can people get engaged with? How can they connect with you to learn more? Because this is really, really just like the tip of the iceberg for what you teach. Thank you for that. So if you head to my website, it's just dara.co, D-A-R-R-A-H.co. There is a whole plethora. You've got everything from the series called Diving Deep with Deepak and Dara to a free masterclass with a guided meditation on living a more meaningful life with he and I. There are all of the interviews from Forbes with all the celebrities, as well as tons of really tactical pieces that I've written. And then there's three other guides. There's the 55 Best Questions Guide that you talked about. There's the six steps for more effective goal planning. And there's the shit no one tells you about starting a business. Because frankly, I think there's a lot that happens behind the scenes as you're building that people don't talk about. And instead, we just look at this like American idolization effect where everything is so sexy and cool and it's not always like that. So I wanted to keep it real. So those are all on there if you need anything. Thank you for keeping it real. We, 
<laughs> we need that and we appreciate that. So this is amazing. Thank you so much. I really do want to have you back to do like take two on a lot of this or let's more do it. dive into this because I have so many more questions left to ask you. So thank you for everything that you're doing and the inspiration that you are in the world. We appreciate mm. you, my friend. Thank you. Yeah.